<laughs> He'll ask me to introduce myself. I'm Shane Batson. Currently, I'm the director of geology at Jericho Oil Corporation. Um, I've probably met most of you at some point. I was hired out of college by Charles Wickstrom, but he's with Sayal Corporation, and uh, stepped right into uh, a horizontal drilling program in the Mississippi Chad on the Highway 60 trend. I think I drilled seven or eight horizontal wells before I drilled my first vertical well, uh, which is an unusual way to start. Uh, but that's how the world was in 2003, working for Charles. Uh, and it was sort of hold on to your uh, saddle horn because the next uh, 15 years are pretty exciting, courtesy of Charles as well. Uh, Jericho Oil Corporation is a, a publicly traded company on the, on the Vancouver Exchange. Uh, they came from North Dakota after an asset sale and actually chose Osage County to come into uh, for for a lot of reasons, uh, regulatory certainty, uh, ease of permitting. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not joking, this is, this is really their, their reason. And, and I met the principals of Jericho uh, when they came to pay their bond after they purchased the uh, Chaparral Horizontal Wells. They came to pay their bond, uh, and it happened to be the very first day that the Bureau of Indian Affairs was trying to explain to us how the uh, new CFRs were going to benefit everybody. So you all were mostly at that debacle. And all they wanted to do was get money and it took forever. Anyhow, after two years of not being able to deploy any capital, uh, they sold all their assets and exited the county. Um, so I now have no affiliation with the Osage, except I still care. Uh, the geology is great. It should be, uh, if not flourishing, it shouldn't be languishing. Um, and I'm still dedicated to the fight against the Bureau of Indian Affairs and what they've, they've in effect done to the mineral estate and all the producers. So, uh, but we'll save that for tomorrow at the producers' round table. Today we're going to talk about the, the horizontal plates of, the, of Osage County, uh, of the Mississippian Age Rock specifically, and a look back on some of the work that has been done and maybe uh, a little bit of a look forward to what, what remains. And, you know, the resource in plates is significant. Uh, it's very expensive oil to get, even in the best of situations, uh, and almost impossible to get given the regulatory strangle that the Bureau currently has on uh, that. Is that an okay introduction, Bill? You bet. All right. <laughs> All right, so... Uh, uh, a little bit difficult to, to see from this with the, with the glare. Um, is there a way to turn off lights? Yeah. Looks like a screen, not a switch. That's progress. Um, yeah, the Mississippian uh, rocks present here in Osage County outcrop in northwestern uh, Arkansas, actually all along northern Arkansas, what's called the Springfield Plateau. We call it the Boone in Arkansas. It's the same rock that is being exploited in the Sooner Trend, uh, although it's deeper and much thicker there. It's the same uh, silica-rich uh, carbonate deposits there. As you move south in the stack, that where, where Mike Kirk and I were speaking about, you, you get into a, a more shaly environment. But the, the rock here is the lower Osage, of the northern stack, where some, some really good wells have been drilled, some really bad wells have been drilled as well. Um, so we're going to look at three wells that tested the three different types of uh, Mississippian deposits in Osage County, and they span about 40 miles over the south. Thank you. That's great. <clears throat> All right, outline. Introduction. We're going to look at a review of the historical production. Uh, I usually put this up here for, for the Osage uh, shareholders that are present, uh, so they have a, an understanding of where the oil has come from and maybe where it might remain. Uh, we're going to look at the characterization of the reservoir, stimulation, which is critical. Understanding what rock you're completing and how best to complete it is important. It turns out very important. Uh, production and then uh, conclusion. And, you know, I wish this man was still around, that he sort of a, you know, reminds me of times that were good, but he actually knew where the, all, the, all the bodies were. So I think this was the last 
Energy Summit that he, uh, he participated in for his <coughs> unfortunate and untimely passing. So the modern era of uh, horizontal exploitation in Osage County began in the early 2000s with the Seha Corporation under the direction of Charles Wickstrom uh, shooting a 3D on the Highway 60 trend, the North Hardy unit, and drilling the first horizontal well in, in 2003. This was coming off out of the uh, success that they've had in Illinois, in Illinois Basin drilling in the Forbes Lake Park. Uh, the first well came in flowing 600 barrels a day, up seven inch casing on a, on a rather short lateral. It was a, a seven inch casing. It was a, maybe an 1800 foot lateral, <coughs> something like that. And we went on to drill another 17 wells. Uh, they weren't all good, but they, the overall project had a, a, exceptional economics. Some of the wells were very good. But they were all completed, open hole, no stimulation, lateral lengths ranging from about 1,800 feet to 3,000 feet. It's about the longest. Feet. And they were all targeting a seismically defined objective. The, the, the porosity in the chat is such that it, 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 it's a uh, unique signature in seismic. Um, that first decade uh, really began to change the complexion of Osage County. Uh, you had the CBM uh, exploitation by Amvest and the work that Sullivan and Company was doing on the Red Fork dewatering around Grey Horse, and things were definitely looking up. Uh, there was a long period of time there where I figured I would uh, certainly be among, among the next generation of people making, you know, uh, successful living in Osage County. I don't know that anybody coming in today could say that, unless they were selling marijuana. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, as multi-stage fracture simulation matured, uh, in 2003, there was no multi-stage horizontal stimulation. There, the first fatal shale well hadn't been, been drilled horizontally yet. Uh, but as the stimulation matured, we began ex you know, testing tighter rock. Um, and the rock that Spyglass tested in the 2009 to 2012 was some of the tightest rock in, in the mid-continent, nearly <coughs> pure uh, crystalline chert. Um, approximately 100 horizontal wells were drilled in this period, mostly for targeting the Mississippian. Most of them didn't work. Uh, but Spyglass had some exceptional results and led uh, in Canna into the county, but more importantly and more specifically led Devon Energy into the, into the county. They actually uh, took over a concession uh, based on one of our, our wells in the southwestern part of the county. Um, they were actively drilling until Gettner Drummond sued them, at which point they pulled all of their permits and exited the county entirely. And that probably, with them, left any real ability to, to, to develop these reservoirs. So the future of Osage production, if it can happen at all, will rely heavily on the exploitation of the Mississippi. So here is a, uh, we went through the yellow book, uh, which everybody probably has a copy of, and we tied a, the, the cumulative production through 1996 to each quarter section, and then we basically heat mapped it. So the, the I don't want to tell this, but the baby blue, can you see, can you see that? Yeah. Oh, okay. um, no, you won't be able to shine it. So these are all the leases that have produced more than one barrel of oil. If it's a white background, and that means it, it has never produced oil, it doesn't mean that it hasn't been drilled, it just hasn't been produced. Uh, 4,000 leases have produced oil, um, which represent about 43% 40, 40, uh, of the, the total county. Uh, here I've pulled it to leases that have made over 100,000 barrels. And there's been 1,381 of them. Uh, 1,381 leases have produced about 90% of the oil, and more than half of those were drilled before 1923. Wow. So we're still living on the legacy of those early discoveries. The, the Purdue uh, presentation is a, is a really good example of that. The terrain is still largely unexplored, uh, particularly to the west. The reason for that is you don't have, outside the Burbank, you don't have a huge 
uh, presence of the, of the Pennsylvania sands to the west. You're in a more carbonate terrain, and it's the, the Mississippian is the remaining land. So You also have a general lack of infrastructure in the west, mostly due to the large ranches that are out there. Uh, if you were to step into Kay County or Pawnee County or Payne, you've got section roads everywhere. Uh, in up around Personia, you don't have township roads. You've got like every other township road. So uh, the lack of access sets up a fairly complicated <coughs> conversation right off the bat. <coughs> if you don't have the back of the Bureau of Indian Affairs to help you get your access, then it's an almost impossible starting point. So a little bit more statistics here. Uh, I didn't have to read these because I haven't memorized them. But 35 of these leases have produced in excess of 2 million barrels, 103, a million to 2 million. So, you know, 50% of the leases that have produced a total of 617 million barrels uh, began producing before 1923. Again, this is an old terrain. I'm not telling anybody that produces oil in Osage County anything new here. Uh, but it is part of the, the history that we don't really think much about, maybe because so let's talk about Missis the Mississippi. And uh, when I first started, you know, conversations around the chat, I, will, I did a Google search for triplitic chert in 2003 and got zero hits. Uh, at which point Charles said, welcome to the most complicated reservoir in onshore U.S. Uh, conversations about the nature of the porosity always involved arm waving and cussing and, uh, and a lot of entertainment for a young guy. Um, I think in the last five or six years, we've really begun to assemble uh, an understanding of the diagenetic history and tectonic history that went into creating that process, and we'll, we'll get in there in a bit. But for simplicity, we look at this system as uh, whether it's been altered or not altered. And by altered, meaning meteoric processes associated with karsting, uh, Pre-Pennsylvanian, pre-Cherokee Sea encroachment, uh, or uh, subsequent hydrothermal alteration, which happened probably at the same time that the Tri-State Mining District was being uh, loaded up with lead. That's probably Wolf Camp in the Permian in age. Uh, the unaltered is just the tight uh, troops and silica-rich lines that were part of the initial deposit out on the ramp. And then you have sort of a middle ground of just medium altered. And these are rocks that have 10 to 20% porosity. So on the, on the conventional, highly altered side, this is 35 to 48% porosity. And what you need there is a, uh, you need a trap, uh, you need a, uh, a charge, and then a well bore that connects it to the atmosphere and that rock will flow to the surface without hardly any stimulation. And that's where most of the Mississippian production in Osage County has come from. You, know, you barely tap into the top, you set casing, you bring in Dean Eiler's rig, and you tap into that, and the rest is you know, history. On the other side, you've got the unconventional, we call it unconventional, and unaltered. This rock is 2 to 6% porosity, typically has a good uh, crossover on a neutron density log. It's the same rock at the sooner trend. This rock requires you know, 10,000 barrels of fluid pumped into it at a, at a high rate to generate enough permeability to flow. flow. There have been very few examples of this in Osage County. Uh, the most notable would be uh, the Watchhorn Field down in 23-3, which extends from, from Pawnee County up into Southern Osage County. Uh, that was a Phillips discovery. We pretty much call the Watchhorn, or we recognize the Watchhorn as the eastern extent of the Sooner Trend, which it isn't wrapped into that field, but it's the same, uh, the same reservoir type same high fluid volume stimulation. In the, in the Burbank field proper, there's one example that we were able to identify where Seha had deepened a well that had targeted a real thin Burbank uh, about 250 feet down into the Mississippian and they did a 11,000 barrel bullhead frack on 250 feet of open hole. I think it made 48,000 barrels of production, if I remember correctly. Uh, but real spotty uh, historical vertical completion on this uh, unconventional side. And on the semi-conventional side, uh, you see up around four-acre Personia um, 
some of those anticlines mapped by the USGS in 1918 were tested. They tested these in the 80s, late 70s and early 80s, and they put a, a 500 barrel frack on them and they make 15,000 barrels. Uneconomic, but uh, a good show one. So that's a three general classification. Um, we're going to look at three wells. The Blue Star is going to be uh, testing the, we tested the unaltered and semi-altered rock. The Green Star is the Highway 60 trend and the Yellow Star is a pure uh, unaltered section of, of, of Mississippi. And in effect, a horizontal test of the northern extent of the Watchorn field. It's a great map. That Burbank is really something. Okay, so what do these look like? We'll go through a couple of examples of logs. Each of these logs will have the resistivity on the left and the, the, the neutron density on the, on the right. And I've got a scale of 100 feet right here. We all know the Mississippian is typically about 300 feet in Osage County. With the exception, I think, on the whitetail fault system, it's a little bit thinner. Um, and on the right, I've, I've identified what this rock looks like. So you can see there it's got 4% porosity about and in excess of, here's your 100 ohm mark. So we're up over 1,000 ohms of resistivity. Uh, this in here, where your resistivity is in the 10 ohms and it's tight, we see that as non reservoir rock. It's uh, on image logs, it's very finely laminated. If gas was $18 at MCF, it might be a good gas reservoir, but it's, you could have a real hard time getting any oil to come out of that rock. It's there, it's just a matter of getting it to flow. So many of the logs in Osage County were circa 1950s, so all you have is an old e-log, and it's, uh, which is it, it, handy because those e-logs are noisy, it, you know, when you get to the Mississippian, but you can always see that, you know, go zero to 50 and then zero to 500, so that 100 ohm resistivity is two decades in on the wrap over, uh, which makes it easy to map on, on the old, old Summer J e-logs. This unaltered rock is by far my favorite rock that we tested. The chat is always fun to drill super fast, but the, the, uh, the potential of this unaltered rock and that it's present in almost every section of Osage County or well represented in the subsurface uh, makes it, you know, the sort of rock that you could keep drilling over and over and over again. Uh, this is an example of a semi-altered and at the top you can see the porosity here is coming up, this is your 10% porosity line, so 0, 10, 20, 30. And you can see up at the top, you're around 10% porosity. Here, again, you're at that probably 4 to 6%. So in this case, you've got a, uh, an unaltered middle section, and then the upper part is a semi-altered. So there's been something that is, has helped create that porosity. That's not carbonate grainstones, it's you know, almost pure silica. And you can, if you were to evaluate the the PE curve on, on a high resolution patch, you see that it's jumping from two for silica up to four for, for carbonates. This basal section is your, is your kinderhook line. It is almost a pure limestone. Occasionally you see a, a dolomite uh, developed down there. That may be a play, but I don't know anybody who's tried it. The permeability is indicated in, in the spread of the, the curves right here on your induction tool. If you don't have that spread, it doesn't mean you don't have permeability. It just means that this particular wellbore encountered enough fractures for those curves to, to spread out a little bit. And on here, you can see the amount of silica that they're calculating, that somebody's calculating on their petrophysics. And here is a situation where you've got uh, highly altered Highway 60 trend style rock uh, on top of non reservoir. 2% porosity, very highly laminated rock. This particular well came from, from uh, what we call the Solomon Creek Field, just north of the Great Horse Development by uh, Solomon. Uh, we ran a drill stem test. You can see the resistivity. It's crazy. But you go from zero resistivity to you know, 200, 200 ohms of resistivity within like 75 feet. And I don't know that that sort of happens anywhere else. Uh, but we actually drill stem tested all the way down to zero ohms resistivity. You can't see it here, but it actually falls off. It's less than zero, if that's possible. Uh, the porosity is uh, an effective porosity of around 40%. Um, 
The drill stem test was all oil, highly gas cut oil. It was a really nice drill stem test. So nice that, that we, we were going on down to test the, 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 the Wilcox uh, and we were able to bring Summerjay in. It's probably been 20 years since Summerjay had been into Osage County. And for sure the first image log that they had run in the county, this is 2009, uh, the well on perforations, we perforated right at the lowest resistivity, which, by the way, calculates at 140% water saturation, which, if that doesn't throw water saturation calculations out the window, nothing will. Um, it came in at 250 barrels a day, uh, natural with, with perforations only, and uh, no water. So I don't know how you get 140% SW and no water, but Charles, he can explain it to you later. So this is a classic example of the Highway 60 trend rock. It was identified through 3D seismic. So again, now we're going to look at like what, how do you stimulate this rock? And if one thing has happened in the last 10 years, it's the destruction of capital by the leadership of the engineering community. Uh, every engineer came to a new horizontal play with some sort of limited entry design. And limited entry being, if you're going to pump at 90 barrels a minute, you divide that by 2.5, and that tells you how many holes you're going to have, and that's your 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 that's as much science as went into your your stimulation design. They may cluster it or spread it out or reduce the distance, and they'll wow you and razzle dazzle you with their their terminology. But at the end of the day, limited entry doesn't work on most rock. Uh, in the case of a conventional, highly altered open hole, no stimulation, no, uh, there have been a few tests of uh, the altered, of stimulating the altered rock, none of them have been, been effective. The most important thing you can do is get the bit in the rock, right, which means not above the 40% porosity by three feet, you got to be in the 40% porosity rock. Uh, the, and that's just simply because the, the permeability is still so low that if you don't hit that rock that drills at 30 seconds a foot, you're simply not going to see any hydrocarbons. Um, on, the, on the unconventional, unaltered side, um, we, we describe the ideal stimulation as being short stage length, so 200 foot stages, 250 foot stages, with long cluster high shot density. And most completion engineers will laugh the geologists right out of the room when they bring this up, but you're actually seeing industry move towards this, this philosophy. It's more expensive. Shorter stage lengths are more expensive, but the cost of a, a slow dry hole is is untenable, or it is now. There was a period where it seemed they could drill as many as they wanted. What I mean by long cluster, uh, our final stage design is three five foot clusters with six shots per foot. So each cluster has six shots times five for 30, and we have three of those, so you have 90 shots per stage and you're fracking at 90 barrels a minute, which kind of blows the entire thinking of, of uh, limited entry out. Uh, we call this unlimited entry. In, in effect, we could pump as much water as you could squeeze down, but you can't actually pump that much water down the casing. What we rely on here is what every geologist knows is, is this heterogeneity within mechanical strength that exists in these rocks, be it from fractures, or whether you're in a more lime, limey deposit or a more silica deposit, one of those clusters is going to take 80% of your of your rate, and then you drop ball sealers, and the next cluster that's weakest in, in the mechanical strength is going to take it. It's not ideal, but it's much better than the alternative, which is limited entry. And from you know, to to just sort of conceptualize what permeability, what I mean by this. The vectors here, the arrows, are sort of, if you were to just open hole this thing, you're going to pull fluids from very far away or from very close. And in the case of the unaltered rock, you're going to be pulling fluids from just right in the, in the well, near the well, maybe two feet away. That's how tight the rock is. With the chat, it, maybe it's 400 feet on either side. But the rock on the left, if you want to reach out and get more reservoir established, you're going to have to do it through hydraulic fracture stimulation. Um, you have issues with, with, with fractures that run through here. 
And some of them are thief zones, some of them are water bearing. Uh, in one of our wells, we open hole tested it, uh, and it, I peed at 9 million cubic feet a day. The image log had a two foot fracture that had like infinite porosity on it. So it, it was, we depleted it quickly, but it was at a, yeah, anyways, we think that it was part of the original gas cap of the Burbank that extended up dip into the, into the Mississippi. I can draw. Okay, so unaltered stimulation. This is the rock that exists throughout most of the county. This is the rock of the Sooner Trend. Uh, it doesn't extend very far south into Pawnee County. Um, but where it is, it is very productive horizontally, or has a potential to be productive horizontally. It's also very easy to understimulate. And if you understimulate a horizontal well, you have just destroyed capital. You will never, you know, a rocket attack on Saudi Arabia's refining capacity won't save you. Um, so there's been hundreds of millions of dry holes drilled into the, the, this rock in the, in the northern stack in particular, mostly because of stimulation. The rock is there, the oil's in place, they're just understimulating the, uh, the reservoir. So long cluster, high shot density offers the best results today. There's creeping back into the conversation is Packers Plus. We all remember how slick those young engineers thought Packers Plus were as a thing of beauty, except that it didn't work at all. Uh, and part of the reason is that in, in the case on the right, the packers are at the top and the bottom. You're looking down on the well board. And if you have one big fracture in that rock, which you probably do, it's going to steal every bit of your volume. And you're going to leave the rest of it understimulated. Whereas with perf and plug, you actually have a chance. You still may have one or two stages that, that get thiefed away. But you've at least got a shot at stimulating you know, the reservoir. Again, this is initially we were doing 400 foot stage lengths with 100 feet in between clusters. We now think maybe 35 to 50 feet is the appropriate amount. So the results that you see, kind of keep in mind that that's maybe a third of what's potential out here. Uh, and that's what I'm illustrating here with these superhero esque uh, question marks is how much do we leave behind? Because the rock is so tight. You know, it could be, the, the oil molecule could be right over there at the coffee pot and you never drop the pressure low enough to get it to migrate. It's just going to be there forever. Here's a production profile of one of the Highway 60 trend wells drilled in 2005. Um, yeah, this well has an EUR of almost 260,000 BOE, 90% of its oil. And this is one of the most economic wells drilled in Oklahoma in the last 20 years. And we had a, a dozen of these like this. Uh, the problem with the chat is it's not everywhere. It's you know, maybe in 30% of the area of the Cherokee platform, and it's probably trapped in five. And you've got to use 3D seismic to get it. And you've got to have a big enough area to shoot. So trying to chase this outside of Osage County was difficult. Um, Osage County was great because you could get a seismic permit to shoot over everybody else's leases. You could. You can't necessarily do that now, um, per the interpretation of the superintendent. Um, here is a test of an unaltered section of rock. So this is high resistivity, uh, 4 to 6 percent porosity, but it's sitting underneath uh, a semi-altered rock, which we think is pretty well loaded with water. People want to bring the water that you're producing from the Arbuckle because there's no Woodford out here as a seal. We're fairly confident most of the water is in the upper part of the Mississippi and where the karstic terrain is. But on this 1,200 feet of lateral that we tested, uh, the EUR we, we, we calculated was 160,000 barrels, which is quite a bit of oil. But if you look at what's happening with the water versus the oil, the, those two systems are completely unrelated. The, the, the decline on the oil is steep, which you would expect from a fractured, a fractured well, and the decline on the water is it's declining, but just not very much. So we were producing 
you know, 20 barrels of oil a day and 5,000 barrels of water, which is a pretty, pretty tough, uh, at $100 it's tough, at 50 it's impossible, and if you have a regulatory environment that's choking you out as you're declining, as your oil cut is declining, it makes it almost impossible, no, it does make it impossible. So there's, uh, you know, this is encouraging, and there may be a way to avoid water or make the oil decline less steep. But more than likely, you're going to end up with a 1% cut, and that's just going to be the reality. And so you need the economics to justify operating at that sort of level. Uh, this, well, I apologize for the faint, almost invisible curves here. Uh, water is the blue at the top. The green is the oil, and red is the inconsequential gas that we're, we're measuring. And the big question mark are just periods where we shut it in because it was uneconomic. This well started out at about 230 barrels a day from, I think it was 2,500 feet of lateral. We had drilled 3,500 feet. Uh, we tested, we did five, six stages, and then ran out of water. The pond wasn't as deep as we thought. So we produced it uh, to the point where we were making you know, five to 6,000 barrels of water and 30 barrels of oil a day, and it just simply was uneconomic. And this was actually back at high oil prices. It sat, it sat shut in for a year and a half, and we decided to test the last uh, 900 feet at the heel. Uh, we did a, we have modified our stimulation to 300 foot stage lengths with three clusters. So we did three, we did four stages in that 900 feet, however that math works. And this well actually came in at 903 barrels a day on the first 24 hour period. That's not, that's like full 24 hours, 903 barrels of oil. It was around 7,000 barrels of water, but you can see the oil and the water were uh, declining together, which is a positive thing. 900 barrels in 24 hours in Osage County is unheard of, but we actually had that sort of volume happen. That happened on a, it's basically a barrel per, per linear foot. So a very positive uh, trend. And then here's, Probably the best well that's been drilled horizontally in Osage County. Uh, fairly complicated production history. Um, we treated the first three stages, uh, uh, but it was stage one was 400 feet, and then 2A, 2B, and 3A were 200 foot each. Uh, the well was flowing, so we decided to shut it in, build the battery, and let it let some of the, the pressure off. Uh, which we did through this period. So this was a, an IP of around 400 barrels a day on the first bit, and that's from 1,000 feet. Uh, we then re-entered the well, uh, completed stages 5 through 10, so that'd be uh, another several thousand feet, and put that on production. Um, and that came in at uh, the first 24-hour period was, was 1,400 barrels uh, a day. Uh, I think that you know, we started at 10 a.m., so when reports came in, it was right around 1,000. But a really exceptional well. It made about 60,000 barrels in the first 12 months, um, and is still capable of making, I think, about 10 barrels a day. This well was in a situation where there was no altered rock above it, so no water above it, no water below it, and, and all the water that we were producing was mostly load water. So you can see the oil and the water are declining together here. This, this, uh, this sort of reservoir exists in probably 20% of Osage County. All right, so let's talk about how this rock came to be so complicated. Um, you know, the history is complicated and poorly understood, but we have been making improvements in it, mostly through the work of, uh, at the outcrop with the Oklahoma State University, uh, Wichita, State University and then the University of Arkansas. Those two universities have spent a lot of time on the outcrop and, and with high oil prices and a lot of uh, industry interest. We made some progress. I don't know what's happening technically. Um, so karstic terrains, rich tectonics, and hybrid thermal <coughs> alteration, oil, gas, water, migration, multiple episodes better sort of part of what, what the history here is. So uh, the well on the left was drilled two basements back in the 80s. 
uh, and I've got the, the whole Mississippian section here. So you've got the Kinderhook and then the, uh, the unaltered reservoir greater than 100 ohms. This yellow line's at 100 ohms. And you can see the porosity's 2 to 4%. This well's uh, 1,700 feet away, due east. And here's my 100 ohm line. And you can see that no part of that rock is over 100 ohms resistivity. So, but the gamma rays look the same, the kinder hook looks the same. When we logged it, we thought the tool was broken. We had some J run, we actually bring out a new tool, they logged it again, and sure enough, that's what it looks like. But we cored this entire section, and when we went to look at the core at uh, Core Labs, it was 220 feet of hydrothermally, uh, uh, hydrothermal breccia. You can see these chirp clasps, and they were floating in a matrix of triple and you can see the scalloped edges of the of the uh, chemical front that leached away the carbonate, leaving this this chert behind. What's interesting is that the chert was loaded with oil, so the, the leaching event was was subsequent to the charging of the system, which is important and really strange. And that's what it looks like. So where you see orange on the left is triple filled with water. This is in UV light, and you can see these chert clasps and these fractures that are bright blue and bright gold. Those are filled with oil. And so you, you can't build enough pressure in this system with that porous rock to charge the chert. You, you rupture the system. So the chert clasps were actually filled prior to the leaching of the carbonate and creation of the, of the triple light. And we see examples uh, of this in the Ozarks. You have chert clasps out on the gravel bars of the Kings River, you can find these you know, big boulders or cobbles with chert clasps fractured, and they're in a, in a matrix of triplet. And here's a pure triplet chert, but you still have bands of unaltered, unaltered chert. So when you have an intermedded chert lime, that lime is real silica rich, and when it encounters a, a particular type of fluid, that lime will leach out leaving a matrix of silica that's also chert. It's just a very high porosity chert. I think we're starting to get our, our arms less arm waving, still a lot of beer drinking and arguing, but less arm waving. <laughs> so here, here's a block diagram that I created. St. Joe's deposit on sh shallow water, probably neck deep. You could walk from you know, eastern Blaine County to, 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 to uh, Harrison, Arkansas, and never get your head wet. Uh, water starts to deepen, uh, the, the, the chirps and lines of the lower boom get deposited, and then the upper boom gets deposited. And then uh, these things are fractured, probably uh, early, early tectonics associated with the Washita orogeny, and where those fractures are happening because it's subarily exposed, when rain falls, it's preferentially uh, eating away at those, those fracture points. And then you start to pick up uh, real tectonics and you, you start to get, um, actually this is my meteoric process, water coming down, migrating out, and now you're getting some left lateral strike slip starting to happen in, in the late Osagian time. We know that it's happening then because of our isochron work on 3D seismic. If you flatten it on the big line, there's still a, a, a tilted plateau terrain uh, at the Mississippi. So, so pre-Cherokee shale, the tectonics in, in the Cherokee platform are starting to to happen and with these wrench tectonics, you get more rubberization, you get the beginning of pop-up structures. This yellow area would in effect be a rubble zone. You then bury it in the, here you're burying it in, in the Cherokee shales. And then hydrothermal fluids are moving in and, and the pink here is, is representing where that hydrothermal fluid has encountered a rock that is susceptible to diagenetic alteration. So we call it a a diagenetic susceptibility, and in this case, the Osage A, which is the upper, it has a higher diagenetic susceptibility than Osage B, and that's simply because of a difference in, in original ethology. The Osage A, or the upper Osage here, is mostly a silicious line, versus the lower being pure chert, pure line, pure chert, pure line. And from, if you were to strip that away, and look to see, you know, it's very jointed, it's very angular. Um, our big 3Ds show that the, the triplite deposits at, at the subcrop 
are, are tectonic in origin and are mirrored very well in the tri-state mining district to the northeast of the picture. So, conclusions. Uh, three distinct play concepts, conventional, semi-conventional, and unconventional. You've got to know what you're after. And if you don't have what you're after and you're going to try it, you've got to try it right. So you've got to stimulate it right. Uh, if the future is going to be bright, um, you have to have significant investment in infrastructure. Electrical infrastructure, none of this works without electricity. And a drive up four acre road will illustrate well what the problems with infrastructure are in the areas where this is most prospective. Uh, water disposal is critical. Even if you just get back the water that you pumped in, you're going to pump in the 150,000 barrels of water on a, board, on a single mile lateral. You've got to put that water somewhere and it isn't going into a creek. Um, the EPA shut down you know, Arbuckle Disposal in the southwestern part of the county. Uh, my guess is you could drill a disposal well, permitted as just a well, but the minute you submit a 139 to convert that to an injector or disposal well, Robin Phillips will never let that thing see the light of day. So there probably won't be any more disposal wells drilled under the current regime. And gas takeaway. Uh, the gas, there isn't a lot. The GOR out here is one to one, but there's pretty good percent of helium out here, 2% two, two in some places, uh, which can, can take your gas theoretically from you know, sub $2 in NCF, or maybe $1 in NCF, to 4 or 5 which which is material. Uh, there is no gas infrastructure in Western Osage County. So infrastructure is critical to the future of, of production here. Um, the regulatory environment FUBAR, I mean, FUBAR is a nice way to put it. Um, you know, these people are criminal and, and should be put in jail for what they've done to all of us. Uh, the regulatory environment must be encouraging of investment and respectful of the capital intensity required. Uh, I think that the, you know, the, the talk on the CO2 flood was a pretty good example of that. You know, you've got to plan a year out. We have friends that have been waiting for over one year for a permit to drill a well in the middle of a field that's developed on 40 acres space. But that's only crazy people or people that can't get out are still in. And I don't mean that as a, anything mean to my friends that are still here. It's, you can't sell these barrels. More in America couldn't sell their, their production. Um, and you've got to have a realistic world to expectations. This is across the industry. Aubrey McClendon is no longer with us, and the 25% royalty rate that he established in, in Texas should go away as well. It kills your economics. 20% in Osage County, you won't ever get another horizontal well drilled on 20%. The capital investment is simply too great. These wells are three to four million dollars. And with the price volatility, the amount of electrical, water, and gas takeaway, you just simply can't support it. You can ask for it, but you're not going to get the best operators because they understand the reality of what needs to go into it. Um, and you know, 160 acre leases that are competitive bid bidding, I'm not I'm not going to compete for 160 acres if I was, if everything got fixed and you could drill again here in a predictable way, you can't do it on 160 acre leases. And if you've got the idea and you've got the technical team to do it, to go to a competitive process and maybe be able to lose out to somebody that has no experience and it just has more money that they're willing to pay for something that they're going to try to flip to somebody else, uh, the conversation is over. So what we, when I first came into the industry, there were negotiated leases that were negotiated directly with, with, with the Osage Minerals, Minerals Council. And moving back into that environment is probably the best way forward. There's still a lot of lots we've got to get through, but you know, that's just one of them. And they've been, you know, the Osage worked with Spyglass. We were able to establish 640 acre drilling units because the plan is to not drill one per section, but maybe four. And you need the common tank battery, you need the common royalty rate to, to make that efficient. And then, you know, Lloyd Gatewood, I'm always amazed at how many, how many and how smart the guys used to be. Uh, Lloyd Gatewood was remarkable. Everything that he wrote was spectacular. And every map that he made was incredible. But this, you yeah, know, the Arbuckle Carbonate remains the greatest mystery of any sedimentary rock unit in the geological column. We haven't even 
begun to strike the, strike the surface there. We've, we've got cores with, with oil in the Arbuckle 40, 50 feet below the top of the Arbuckle, and there's no structural component that we can see seismically. So there's all these little bitties, traps, you know, strap traps set up in there. So that's it. Um, any questions? Watch the blue ball Oh, uh, it means. Can you, turn, can you turn the video off for just a second? <laughs> <laughs> just the audio. Fouled up. It means fucked up beyond reason. <laughs> 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 or something like that. I got the first one right. All recognition. Beyond all recognition. Yeah. <laughs> Much of my life has been through hard. <laughs> <laughs> um, any other questions? Yes. Is there such a thing as variable royalty rates? There are variable royalty rates. We're looking at an asset in Canada now that has a, a rate that's a function of, of price of oil. How about Osage Canada? Not that I'm aware of. That's 20%. That 20% would be pretty heavy in my opinion. It's, it, it, it's, 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 and, uh, in, it's impossible. It's impossible. We just started lower. It's a good oil. Yeah. That kind of thing. I don't, you know, to, to encourage people in, you know, what, 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 what we see the whole northern part of the state needs is a, is a fresh look at horizontal Mississippi. We know how not to do it. We've got a billion dollars destroyed to prove it. Um, but we need to encourage new drilling. We're, we're looking at this and, you know, we're leasing it $50 in an eighth just outside of town. Yeah. Tali? <clears throat> Your comment, consolidated 640 acres. Uh, what else could we do on our side to promote this type of activity? Um, that's a great question, and, and I'm sure everybody in here has some ideas. Uh, to encourage drilling, um, you can't get away from the fact that the Bureau has made it impossible to, to spend money. If we wanted to spend $10 million this year, you couldn't do it. Um, so you're up against that. So if, if we're just going to talk about what the council could do, you know, I would put, you know, four square, you know, a two by two together. So you've got four square miles and try to find somebody to come in and, and test it. Um, I think maybe if the Osage are partners in it, not just royalty, but also working interest. That may be a change. And uh, you, uh, more 3D seismic, putting 3D seismic concessions together that you could then take two people that know how to do 3D seismic. Um, you know, again, low cost of entry and trying to get the maximum amount of money out. In this, in this environment today, we should be shooting a lot of, a lot of seismic. Um, Just a follow-up comment, yeah. too. We, Bill, Ann, and I, we've been doing this working well. We're getting ready to launch another uh, review. But we're looking at, if we don't launch a lease and launch federal action, then we think there might be room to not have to do all these stringent steps. So that means we have to take a little more control over the process. So we would direct our attorneys to do that. Once we get into that realm where they're doing a lot of checking, that that launches all the federal review. Right. So we think, we're yeah. thinking, I can't promise it, yeah. but we're looking at the terror option, the, the, the compact contract, down to the tribal level, doing those analysis and decision making. Maybe we might be able to get around these long delays, but I can't make any promises, but that's, where we're looking now. <laughs> That's positive, but what you're saying is, or, or embedded in that is, the, the idea that issuing a lease is a federal decision, and you know, only Gettner Drummond would interpret it that way. <laughs> His entire lawsuit was based on, on just that. It was a federal decision in the need of a compliance. So, right. yeah, we could, yeah, maybe we just go out there and start drilling with a bunch of Osage protecting the well, well, well site. That's, that's <laughs> any other questions? Was there any Mississippi chat in these areas, these wells that you drilled? Yeah, yeah. In all the wells, let's say, 
Was it productive? Oh, it's the most productive. Yeah, it's just not everywhere. Well, the, yeah, let's clarify that. When, when you say uh, when we use seismic stratigraphy to identify a reservoir, and we call that reservoir the Mississippi Chat, all the other rock that is not 30 to 40 percent porosity is not Chat. That's true. Or it just what? Uh, yeah. You can see it seismically in our terminology. Actually, it was. We had a numeric uh, 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 nomenclature for all the variations at the top of the Mississippi line. Uh, we dealt with uh, we had two, three, five, two, two, four, five, four, five, D. We used all of those to try and discriminate the reservoir types. It's very complex. And so, Shane is the word chat, or I do. It means I can see it seismically. And so chat doesn't necessarily uh, present just on top of the Mississippi line. It can also be so many feet into the line and still have a layer of chat or germ. You can, rest. yeah. So many, you know, maybe 50, 60 feet in. But it's never 40% porosity rock. It's usually okay. 25. Okay, then you mentioned the article having, uh, I guess, breaks. So many feet in? Not breaks, just oil. <clears throat> oh, just oil. Yeah. Uh, this is the line too, does it not? There's oil, there, there's, you know, reasonable estimates of 12, 12 million barrels of oil in place per square mile. I mean, that's, yeah, maybe. So does it, uh, when, you, when, when you say break, I think it's a fracture. Yeah, or I think of a drilling break. Yeah, we're drilling great. So you might drill, get to the top of the arbuckle. I mean, maybe go ahead and drill it down, you might encounter another break 60 feet in, maybe another 100 feet in, it can be good for that. Yes. But the same circumstance happens in the, in the Mississippi as well. Mm -hmm. Highway 60 trend is probably the best rock quality. And then when you say you uh, <coughs> treating these horizontals, I mean, you say that maybe one fracture would steal most of your uh, water that you're injecting you use. Isn't there any method to shut, to, to shut that off like block salt? Maybe? You don't really know what's happening when it's happening. I mean, just the, the downhole, all you know is what your treating pressure is. And that's why you, so each stage you would, you would substage it with ball sealers. Yeah. Or rock salt? Do you need, I mean, do you ever need rock salt? Yeah, the, yeah. No, no. no, not, not when you're pumping 10,000 barrels per stage. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Bob, and then, and then I'm going to let Doc. I'm going to go back to your next, the last uh, slide. I <coughs> applaud you for putting up <coughs> the primary problems we have here. The rates, the royalty rates are too high. It's impossible to deal with the BIA. You have driven off all the oil companies. And you put up probably the best presentation I've seen of the major problems of why nobody will come here. Thank you. Welcome. I would say the royalty rate is the least of our problems right now. Oh, it's you can have a 100% royalty rate. Nobody's going to I work, but, but I, I grilled in Montana and uh, I was negotiating for 10% royalty because they wanted to get me in there in some areas they were walking. They can do 1% royalty and it wouldn't matter. We can't get a drilling permit. So the real problem is is the Bureau of Indian Affairs. There's a, a producer's round table tomorrow. I'm going to moderate it. Uh, it'd be great. Bring everybody. Yeah, but they, this is not an attack on the woman who's attending. This is an, you know, another attempt to try to educate somebody that goes to the swamp and tells tells them what what we're going through and what you know what ultimately the Osage are being subjected to. This we have some flexibility to go to another. Another, uh, another county or another state, but the Osage can't move their mineral state. It's here; they paid for it, and that's yeah, that's a real crime here. And that's I have no dog in this fight any longer. Uh, I wish it did, but you know I'm here simply you know because of Tolly and Bill. I mean, you know I they helped us when we were asking for 640 acre units. They were they were on our side for that and, and I owe it to them for 
you know, to be the same, to help them through all this. So, Jim, you want to come up and oh, introduce oh, yourself? You're doing such a good job. <laughs> <laughs> I can see yours away. <laughs> 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 